c'est ma tournée means it's my round. And um, what we thought is that very often when you go to a bar or restaurant, you know, the, the bar owner will give you a round at uh, the end of an evening just to thank you for being there. And I thought, well, now it's time for, for you consumers to give a round to your bar or to your restaurant to help them out. And you can do that by contributing no more than paying the normal price for your beers. And we will go the extra mile and give 50% of that to the bar or restaurant of your choice. Welcome to Structural Shifts by Aperture, a bi-weekly show that radically reimagines the future of work, society, and business. We take a devil's advocate approach to exploring the massive shifts transforming our economies and our world, and our guests are not afraid to challenge the status quo. To learn more about Aperture, visit aperturehub.co. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, then you may have noticed an observation woven through some of our episodes. And that is the idea that a combination of access to more information, online distribution channels, and rising affluence have killed the idea of the mass consumer. Now we all want better quality goods, special craft tailor-made for us. Today's episode focuses on two Swiss companies rising in the maker movement. First, your host Ben Robinson interviews Mark Maura, COO and co-owner of the sports shoemaker On. On is taking on Nike and Adidas, or Nike and Adidas, depending on where you're living, with a high-end, high-tech trainer, also known as sneaker, that is so lightweight that according to Ben, it feels like you are walking on clouds, thanks to their innovative cushioning technology. And if you're lucky enough to get a meeting with them, then it's definitely going to be outside doing something active because they like their shoes to speak for themselves. The brand is a favorite of sports stars like Roger Federer, who is now actually working with the company. Celebrities also love the shoes, and so do nurses and chefs and people who need to be on their feet all day. After Mark, you will hear from Arthur Vion, co-founder and CEO of La Nebuluse, a craft brewery that is taking on the giants in Switzerland and is starting to expand internationally. This beer maker prides itself on being part of an industry with a heart and a smile. Brewing beer with love and passion and Swiss quality standards. Arthur's company has a lot of local pride and they have done a tremendous amount of really great work during the pandemic to support the local bars and restaurants that usually carry their beer, but had to close their doors because of COVID-19. So very community oriented, both of these companies are. And visiting Arthur's Brewery sounds like it's a must-have experience when in Switzerland. But for now, enjoy these two interviews from some of our favorite makers. Mark, maybe let's just start with you just telling us, for our, for our listeners' sake, what what is On? On is basically a sports company that started out with with running shoes back in 2010, and it started with a cushioning technology. So On has a very specific cushioning technolo- cushioning technology that allows you a soft landing and a firm push off. And the way we do that is with kind of holes in the sole, which we call clouds. So it's the only engineered um, cushioning solution. And it comes with very innovative and sleek designs. So it's a very approachable and uh, very versatile product that you can not only use for running, but also for, for casual wear. That's how it started, and it started with 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 running only. And uh, kind of in the last ten years, we went into outdoor, we went into lifestyle, on went into apparel. So it's become a full fledged uh, sports company. And wh- when the three founders came up with the idea and they came up with the technology, why were they confident they could be successful? Because you know it's a very big market. I think I read that it's something like three hundred and seventy billion dollar market for performance shoes or f- for performance footwear. But it's clearly one that's dominated by, you know, 10 ton gorillas in the form of Nike and Adidas. So how, how comes those guys thought that they could, you know, take on the giants and be successful? I think when you, when you stepped into the first product, you felt something different. So it was a completely differentiated product from everything else was, that was out there. And the market hasn't seen any innovation in the last 20 years. So if you look at running shoes back in 2010, they all look the same and they all feel the same. So, so basically we felt, Hey, there's an opportunity in this market. It hasn't been any innovation, um, no strong direct to consumer brand and the market is huge. Um, you're absolutely right, but that's an advantage because it means if you only get a relatively small share in that big market, that that's already quite sizable. 
and it's a growing market. So this is why back then in 2010, the, the guys decided to, to start the company. And what's the company mission? The mission comes to life when you step into or when you wear our products. And originally, we always said, you know, we want to put the fun into the run. So, so, so the idea is that you have a very different running feeling or a very different uh, feeling when you're moving. And that eventually allows you to move more. And that eventually allows you to run more. So you're spending more time outside. You're spending more time being healthy. And we really believe in what we call the human spirit. And, you know, that people can do amazing things when they're given the opportunity to. And ONS products are allowing you to do so. The technology is really at the heart of the shoe and the 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 lightweight the lightweight running sensation you feel when you're when when you're outside and it's it came out VTH right in Zurich it's painted patented but how difficult would it be for somebody to imitate it or get close to the to the technology I think it would be relatively difficult um, because it's when you when you look at running shoes actually the way you produce them you need uh, kind of tooling you need molds so there's a lot of 3D kind of drawings going into it. You have the foam that needs to have a specific kind of cautioning level and so on. So there's quite a bit of engineering that goes into it to come up with the same running feeling. So it, it's quite difficult, but we always knew at some point, eventually someone will do it. So that's why that's why on always said, hey, you know, we need to reach a certain scale within a certain time. When eventually someone came, comes up with it, then kind of, you know, everyone knows who or what on is. So it's very clear that this is a this is an imitation. And, and we're very lucky that, that we made it so far and that we're in a position right now where kind of that feeling and that technology and ONS patented cloud tech is really associated with ON. And it would be very difficult for someone else, even the big players, to come with such a thing to the market. So I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about the company history. And so you joined the company in 2013, right? Yeah. I, I read, I think it was an interview with David, one of the fa- one of the founders, right? And he said 2013 was a difficult year for ON. Uh, we had a bit of a slump in sales. We, you know, we, we had a few teething up issues scaling the company. How difficult has it been or how challenging has it been for you since you joined to scale this company to meet this the growing international demand for for your footwear? Difficult is probably the wrong word. I think it's more like in- interestingly challenging. And, you know, you you go over, you experience so many different episodes throughout the years. So in the beginning, uh, when I joined back in early 2013, almost 20 people. So it was very small. And, you know, our loss was as big as our revenues. So you were actually fighting for survival which is a very different mode to, to what we're in or what we're in uh, right now or we're in kind of three years later. And then you start growing and you experience lots of growing pains in production, obviously in marketing, in scaling up customer service, in finding the right people. So, but we never experienced it as, or I never experienced it as difficult because it was always associated with positive emotions. We had, we had so much and we still do have so much fun doing it. We're so fortunate to to be able to work with an amazing team, great people, but it's full of challenges. I, I'm a person who tends to get bored pretty quickly, and and you know in in seven eight years I never got bored, not a, not a single day, because the amount of challenges is just so vast, uh, and and I think that's lots of fun. Is Switzerland a good country from which to scale an international business? Yes and no. For us, yeah, for us, the advantages clearly outweigh the, the disadvantages. So it's great to scale because the access to talent is uh, super good. And I think Swiss people uh, and Swiss values and the way we've been uh, brought up really help in international relations. So, so Swiss, people, Swiss people tend to be quite well-traveled, international. They, they're adapting to different cultures because you essentially got four cultures or three cultures in one country. Um, three languages, four languages in one country. So, so that has helped. The problem with Switzerland is it's a very small home market. So, so if you're the number one player in Switzerland, you're still subscale from a production perspective. So, so that's why on decided already back in 2012 um, that we had to go international super quickly, and we had to make the US our biggest market as fast as we can, and and then Swiss kind of. Switzerland serving as a basis for international expansion 
has has proven very successful and very helpful. Yeah, I suppose it's a sort of double-edged sword, isn't it? Which is, you know, having a small domestic market means that you need to look outside from the beginning. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, internationalization is higher up the agenda for a Swiss company than a you know, comparable US company, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the US, you're basically looking at Under Armour. They did $2 billion in revenues before they left the US. Uh, it would be completely impossible for us to do that. But on the other hand, that means that you're actually building an international company from scratch. So, you know, we, we, we're having already now, we're having several offices across the, the globe in, in all regions. On is present in Brazil, in Japan, in the US, and so on. And it's actually much easier to do that when you're young versus when you're already a $2 billion company and then you're building your first office abroad. So, so I think looking at it from a 20, 30 year perspective, hopefully we'll look back and say we were very fortunate that we, that we scaled kind of and went international so early on. Every single pair has, has a Swiss flag, right? So it's like, it's almost, you know, it's almost like Swissness is at the very heart of, of on. Yes, I think it's Swissness stands for, for, for a few things that are absolutely core to on, to on's product, but also to, to on's values and culture. So it stands for quality, which is super important to us. It also stands for design. It stands for innovation. It stands for reliability. And, and these are values that are, are very core to on and that we're carrying, carrying out. And, you know, all our, design work and all our development is happening in Switzerland. So so the product that you see is truly engineered in Switzerland. It's not manufactured in Switzerland, but it's engineered here. Swiss designers, uh, lots of developers based in Zurich. So it's, it's really at the heart of what you're doing. It seems to me that you're sort of riding a secular trend, right? Which is, it's almost like we've seen the death of the, of the mass consumer and everybody's, you know, we, we now live in a world where producers can can produce things that are much more tailored to our individual needs at the same time as we've become more affluent and we're demanding better quality stuff at the same time as we've become more conscious about the environmental impact of, of production and it seems you're like you're riding this big wave right towards sort of more locally produced more sustainable better quality products yes definitely i mean what 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 we see a lot and what is really core to on is authenticity and that's that's very important to today's consumers and you know it's it's just come very natural to on because this is how it started you know we always say on was was kind of started in the swiss alps or born in the swiss alps so we're all runners we love to run it, the way we started apparel is because we wanted to have apparel for ourselves we never did an apparel business plan to eventually go to so many customers we just said you know we need our own apparel so and and we are very very fortunate that on has grown to such scale and that so many so many uh, people are, are fans of our brand but it's all very authentic because it was never the goal there was never a business plan to go where we are today it basically just happened naturally by by doing what we enjoyed doing and by being true to our values and true to what we believe in and this is some of the, the things that you just said how do you sort of keep or stay authentic the bigger you get because you know if if, if you're success so far has been built on this idea of you being really high quality and a bit niche. What happens when you're mainstream? So I think I read that, you know, you already have a 10% market share in Germany. So how do you keep authentic at scale? I think we're, we're holding ourselves accountable to be authentic. So, so on doesn't have a CEO, for example. So we're, we're kind of like the Swiss government, but that means there's lots of checks and balances and and, you know, we know each other so well because we've been working together for so many years. We've built a team together. So everyone has an understanding of, of kind of who we, who we are. So and it's very important to us that we're staying true to ourselves. And we believe you can be a mass market brand that is still authentic by doing the same thing. You know, ON hasn't really changed in the last seven years in a sense of kind of the products that we bring to the market. We're still doing more or less the same thing. And we're still very price stable we're still very premium we're still super high quality we're still very innovative and then basically kind of becoming mass market is al almost like the consumer appreciating just the work that we're doing so so why should we change because what we're currently doing right now is appreciated by by our customers um when i asked that question i learned about this sort of you know big consumer trends i mean one is to high quality products you know tick one is to you know and then I think the other big one is to sort of more sustainably source products. Yes. And I know you guys have done a lot of work here to try to make your 
footwear greener. But I suppose the uncomfortable or the inconvenient truth is shoes are largely made of, of, of petroleum, right? So how do you make a green shoe? How do you make a green trainer? You know, actually building on what I said before in, in the last question, if we do it, we want to do it right. So we see a lot of companies kind of almost using it as a little bit as a marketing play. And what we're working on is kind of truly solving the problem. And you make it greener with the product. So a lot, that's just what you said, you know, kind of if you look at CO2, at carbon emissions or whatever, a lot of it is in the product and the materials itself. And part of it is in the production process, but that's the vast majority. So what we're working on is we're working on materials um, that are basically ideally at least recyclable, even better if we can have kind of a 360 reuse cycle, so to say. So we can reuse the product uh, kind of in other products or the residuals of the product. And there's lots of research happening in that space. Um, there is solutions out there. What we don't want to do is we don't want to compromise on the product. So basically the shoe that has no oil component has to feel as good as the shoe that has oil component and this is what takes a little bit of time but this is where a lot of people at on are invested in and we're putting a lot of money to 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 come up eventually with a circular product which is the ultimate goal when we're talking about authenticity one of the things i read when i was researching this podcast is that you guys regularly have meetings out running is that is that true it's absolutely true. So, so for example, Casper, uh, who is one of the founders, and I, we do all our meetings biking, not even running. And it's actually scientifically proven that when you walk or when you move your body, it stimulates your brain. So you come up with better ideas rather than just sitting in a meeting room. And, and, and so we do a lot of people running, biking, walking, and just outside. Including client meetings, I heard as well, right? Including tons of client meetings. And you know, this started again with you know, how do you, we had a t-shirt saying at the beginning, uh, we don't talk about our shoes. Basically what it meant is, you know, just try it on and then you'll eventually experience it. And this is how all the meetings started. We said, you know, we're not going to talk about it. We're going to go on a walk together or on a run together. And that still holds, holds true till today. Lots of our meetings and discussions are happening on the bike or on the run. I have six pairs of on shoes at and the reason I got into on is because a friend of mine just raved about them, right? He's, you know, he said, got to try them. They're amazing. And then since, since then, obviously I've made many repeat purchases. I've, I bought shoes for my friends and I can really see how this is a business that has grown, you know, organically based on just having a wonderful product. Right. And I think, you know, when, when I, when I read about your marketing strategy, you use terms like grassroots, word of mouth. And I suppose the question is, you know, how big can you get? on the back of grassroots, on the back of word of mouth. At some point, do you have to use other marketing strategies? Do you have to, you know, do you have to use sort of, you know, above the line type advertising to, to get to the audience or a big enough audience to really gain massive market share? Or are you comfortable just to grow? I suppose in a very Swiss manner, right? Right. Which is, yeah. you know, you just grow slowly, sustainably, so, so one of the Swiss values is, is also or the, some, something that's very important to one is that we're building a sustainable business in a sense of obviously sustainability, but also financial sustainability. So we, we always wanted to be able to kind of finance uh, or own should be able to finance itself to a large extent. So we had to come up with ways to make our product known that doesn't cost too much. So that's also why on is built kind of uh, on uh, kind of around or on the basis of lots of retailers so when you walk into a store you have your seven running brands and you know eventually the retailer will basically give you kind of your ethics but he will also pull the on and once you're in the on the chance that you purchase it is pretty high and then hopefully you rem remain remain a very loyal customer so and we did a lot of grassroots activities um because and we still do because this, this is really who we are. Then at some point to kind of take the next jump in brand awareness, you need to start doing above the line. And, and this is what we, what we already do. We do tons of digital. So most of our advertising spend will go into digital. We we're, we are very lucky to have great ambassadors and athletes of the brand. We are very lucky to have um, very loyal customers that are actually, as you said, you know, promoting uh, the brand to friends. And, and I think, 
the more mature you get, eventually the more you will start investing in above the line, but in a very different way than we would than the world did it ten years ago. You know, today's uh, advertising environment is completely different. Uh, it's it has to be much faster. All our videos, all our creative is shot in house. We're not working with an agency, um, so so we have to be very fast in with, with what we come up with. Yeah, and again, you know, authentic seems to be the word, right? Because you know, you, it doesn't seem that you pay people to wear on, right? It seems that you just, you know, you just tell their stories. Yeah. So, you know, in an ideal case, and in most cases, athletes or, or, or kind of ambassadors or whatever come to us because they experience the product and they're asking, Hey, can I, can I bear on? Because I feel I can run faster. I can run longer in ons. I, you know, I need less time to recover. So most of our relationships or nearly all of our relationships really kind of emerge from, from obviously the product, but then also friendship with, with, with all the people that are now part of on. And I mean, Roger, who, who has joined a few months ago, um, it's the exact same story. It, it started with the relationship first. Uh, the first discussion we had when we first met him was not kind of targeted at whatever outcome. It was just getting to know each other. And we truly believe if, if you know, interesting people come together, then something, something amazing might emerge. And, and this is how, how, it, you know, how it started with Roger as well. We're going to come back to Roger later. But how much do you, do you envisage doing sort of like, you know, what Nike does, for example, with, you know, with Nike running and how, I suppose building the social context around, around the brand? I think this is one of the next steps, which is really, I think there's a very strong on community. So, and, and, you know, the community basically has a certain stickiness because of the experience this community is sharing. But there's no orchestrated way from on on how to activate this community and, and how this community can really uh, come to life. And there's tons of grassroots activities, again, that we're doing with that community. So you might have heard of something called Togo Run, uh, which is like a, a kind of a, a squad race that we're doing in different countries um, where we bring the community together. We're doing art runs in, in many different cities where we're bringing the community together. But it's kind of the, 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 so bringing the community together on social and really activating them potentially also with an app is definitely something that, that is one of the next steps. I wanted to ask you a question about, a little bit about the demographics of your customer base, because I imagine, you know, you've got elite athletes for sure, right? I mean, you know, and I think there are many of the stories that you tell on your social channels. Then you've got, you know, a lot of amateur um athletes, people like myself who love the feel of the shoes and, you know, and, and make repeat purchases. But I also read that, you know, the demographics much, much broader than that. And I, for example, I read that you guys have a really big following amongst nurses. Is that, is that correct? Nurses and amongst chefs as well, because basically, you know, for, for people who are on their feet all day long, products really helpful because of the cautioning technology that it uses so it's less tiring often it helps people that also do have certain back problems and so on so there's a huge followership amongst doctors nurses chefs and so on it's, it's a super broad customer base it's over 50 percent female tons of elite runners lots of outdoor athletes as well um with the big outdoor push we are doing now obviously lots of walkers as well that are in our products so, so, so it's a very kind of a big customer base. I think what they all share is, is obviously they're all active people that love to be outside and, and they have a, an appreciation of, of quality and design. That brings us on to the pandemic, right? Because you said, you know, people, these are people that love to be outside. How difficult has it been for you to sell footwear during the pandemic? You know, because I suppose you've got multiple challenges. One, I think... Most of your sales go, are through physical retailers. Right? I think you're now stocked in six and a half thousand stores in 50 countries, I think. So you've got the one challenge of, you know, your distribution channels have been disrupted. And then another one is that, you know, people have been asked, um, I suppose it's easy now, but for a long period of time, people were asked to stay at home and, and not exercise too much. So how's, how difficult has the pandemic been for on? I think the, you know, the pandemic actually triggered two consumer, big consumer trends. So, so one is running or walking, despite some people had to stay at home for, for quite some time, but it hugely kind of surged. So, so when you look at uh, cycling case and running case or miles and, and how it has developed, it's, it's, it's grown like crazy over the last weeks. And so you have this huge running boom. 
So that means there's a need for people to get access to that product. And now with many stores closed, the second thing that it has done, it has basically kind of we've leaped for roughly three to four years in, ter in terms of uh, digital adoption. So what it meant for on is immediately when the outbreak happened, we shifted a lot to digital because, you know, we, we cut marketing spend on the physical side because we knew stores are eventually going to be closed. We heavily invested in the digital channels. And we also allowed retailers to have a digital channel to sell on. So if you're a store in the US, um, let's say you're called Runner's Mind, then we basically made an URL for you, which is onrunning.com slash runner's mind that you could share with your customer base. And that would allow the customer base of that store to purchase on product and we would do the fulfillment. So these two elements together ha have actually allowed to overachieve our business plan in April and May. Um, so we've grown stronger than we anticipated due to kind of the crisis and that, you know, that's, that has even to us been a very positive surprise. So we didn't think that impact would be so strong. What's the relative split now of online versus physical sales? Before the crisis, it was roughly 20. I mean, online being our own channel, we also do work with third party online, but let's take our own direct to consumer channel. So you're look, looking at roughly 25 D2C, 75 uh, B2B, and that's basically switched. So April, May is going to be close to 75, 25. Um, so it's completely turned it around. And the what we see now happening in the countries that have reopened is that actually the B2B channel comes back um, to a large extent. So developments in Germany and in Switzerland, the first weeks have been very, very positive, but the e-com channel stays up. So, so it's actually almost a market expansion that is happening, um, which is very positive to see. Let's talk, uh, let's talk again about Roger Federer, right? So I think he jo joined you know, if that's the right term on, I think it was like November last year, was it? It was, is that right? Yes, yes, exactly. That um, sort of garnered quite a few headlines, right? You know, including, I saw there was a piece in the New York Times. And so it's, I suppose the, the first thing it achieved was, you know, elevating the brand, right? Which, which I guess yeah. you'd anticipated. But I think you alluded to this earlier on. It's like not just about Roger wearing the shoes, right? I think he's actually sort of becoming much more involved in helping design the shoes. And so what is, what is Roger's role at on and how significant is it beyond just the marketing impact? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very significant. So we, we both, I think, on and Roger ha had a dream and a vision on, you know, how kind of we could create something that would eventually be there for a very, very long time uh, and would, would be way longer lived than Roger's career. And, and that's because products is at the core of what we're doing it had to come through a product right so so that's why the beginning of it was really starting to work on a product brainstorm on a product and and eventually coming up with ideas and first catches and and uh, you know first products um and that's a big part of roger's role is is kind of helping us thinking through what that product range could look like going forward and he's very actively involved in that at, at the same time Obviously, uh, Roger is an extremely authentic person, uh, and um, he shares the exact same Swiss values uh, that we do. And together, that allows us to also reach a broader community, reach uh, kind of take a step in sports marketing. Um, and and it uh, has been a very, very inspiring partnership so far. How long before there's a tennis shoe? And, like, and how long after that before there's a squash shoe? Probably there never there's never going to be a squash shoe, and uh, you know I'm not sure about the kind of whether there's going to be a tennis shoe. But I, I think everyone who's listening into that should look forward uh, to eventually something come out that that is very authentic to to Roger and to on. So up until now, you've you know you've you've sort of built business and you've grown market share on the back of product innovation, right? So you've had the you know the the cloud rack, cloud flyer, cloud edge, you know. Are you now starting to move beyond just product innovation to product development? So I think one of the things I read, I don't have a pair yet, I'll get a pair, but is that you've now started to move into sort of, you know, I don't know what the term is, sort of, you know, fashion sneakers or fashion trainers beyond just performance shoes. So is, is that, is that, the, is that the, now the shift you're making or is it more just that all these different lines are getting blurred, right? You know, so what was a, a mount, you know, what was a running shoe is now 
doubling up as a fashion shoe. And so yeah. how much is how much is the category changing versus your strategies it's, starting it, to change? It's it's more the it's more the second one. I mean the, the the thought behind this is basically what if I could wear my running shoe every day, everywhere, anytime, and and kind of you know in the past you either had a running shoe, let's say a comfortable shoe, a kind of uh, performance shoe, or you had a fashion shoe, but you would never have a comfortable or performant fashion shoe. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take our tech and bring it to the lifestyle industry. So you actually can wear a very innovative product um, that is extremely versatile, but that is made for a 24-7 active use rather than just running. At the same time, the second thing is we've, we've moved strongly into outdoor. Because again, as I said, you know, we're born in the Swiss Alps and, and, and trail running is something that we love doing. Hiking is something that we love doing. So, so we invest a in lot in outdoor as well. And outdoor at the same time has become a huge fashion trend. So you actually, if you go to the big cities now, uh, if you go, on, go to some of the key tastemakers um, that we see in the retail landscape, then a lot of the silhouettes are now influenced by outdoor. So we're again taking that and also bringing that trend, that, that trend to the to kind of the, how we call it performance all day. You've been, as you said a couple of times, right? You're, you're, you're growing in a very Swiss way, right? Which is very, it's very sort of sustainable, very organic. Yeah. How big do you think on could eventually be, you know, so I'm, and I'm not, I'm not asking for you for your projections, but, but much more sort of, you know, your long, long-term ambition for the company. You know, we never dare to dream uh, to be where we are today. We would never have imagined to be where we are today. So I, I don't think we even have like, we could give you a number or whatever. I think in the end, we're trying to have great product, um, work with great distributing partners, have a great team. And and if we do that right, and if we continue to to execute on the highest level, eventually our customers will appreciate that and that will, will allow on to grow to, to much bigger than it is now. But growth has never been the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal has always been to give you as a customer an amazing experience. And, and the more customers we can target and reach to have that amazing experience, the better it is. Arthur, before you started La Nebuleuse, you were a private banker. How does one go from private banking to craft beer? Well, I was I was working on the the, the trading floor at uh, at a private bank in Geneva, so of course they're very unrelated topics. Uh, I was brewing on the side uh, as a hobby, uh, something I've been doing uh, since I was a student. Like and in your bathtub, kind of in my bathtub, not literally in my bathtub, but in the bathroom for sure. At some point you feel like, or I felt like I wanted to find a, a really meaningful uh, working life. And uh, the entrepreneurial spirit always has been in me. And then it was, a, I'm not gonna say it was a very natural jump because you need to consider a lot of things before jumping ahead, you know? And of course you you go into a lot of uncertainty, but, but it was it was just about taking the the jump and the passion was there the interest was there and it was about doing something uh with my brain but with my hands and with passion and 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 moving ahead with a different uh set of values uh, etc the, the the previous professional experience was useful and proved to be useful in a lot of different aspects uh in the journey so i never regretted having done what i've done but of course I would not go back to to it now, you know, like I'm, I'm I'm very, very happy and proud that I've made this move. And yeah, so I would say it came up naturally and it came out that the deep motivation was that it's early on in my career. I'm young. I don't have any family to feed. It's easier to take risks then as well. So so that's how it came. And when you were weighing up that decision, did you literally weigh, weigh up the pros and cons? I mean, did you make a list of kind of, you know, private banking offers me, you know, a steady career, offers me, you know, fixed wage, it offers me, you know, a large bonus each year. On the, on the negative side, you know, I don't want to wear a suit anymore. I want to do something I'm passionate about. Did, like, how did you make that decision? Oh, well, it's, it's, first, it was not a single decision because I, I went in the game with two very old uh, childhood friends of mine so we all took the decision at the same time and both of them also had corporate jobs so it made it both easier and harder it made it easier because all of a sudden if you're three people convinced about something then it's easier to say okay well 
this must be something right about it. But it made it also harder because then you have on your shoulder the potential for failure of the business, but you also have on your shoulder the potential failure for your other partners who are also taking a lot of risk there. And 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 so of course we discussed about it. So so I in my head I mentally went through pros and cons and I even I think I remember writing down a small list about things that I will lose, you know, by doing them. And sometimes writing them makes you realize ah, am I really willing to let go of that? But it was all the easier because we're still fairly junior in the position. So it's not like we left a huge paycheck on the table. It's not like we left massive benefits, big stock option plans, whatever. It was way earlier in the curve. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, I might not miss much of the curve at this point in time. So it was one of the reasons it was, it was also easier to go ahead at this point in time. So on the one hand, you had your sort of personal desire to do something you're passionate about. But presumably you also saw the the gap in the market, the opportunity to launch something which would be successful. So what what is what is the gap that you saw and how is Lanabilis addressing it? We've been following the craft beer market in other countries just out of interest because you know we're just home brewers and it's quite fun to do that. When we realized, well actually maybe we should do that, then I thought, okay, I had to go ahead and do a few trips abroad to really check what the scene was like to see, okay, how is this different from the current market? Um, I just went to the US for about three weeks uh, in California and just checked the, the craft beer scene there. And then I discovered that the level of development of the market there was way, way, way ahead of the Swiss market. And looking at it, I saw no reason why this would not come here. Purchasing power of the population, the level of education, the center of interest, the it's like all the stars were aligned to see a real you know booming of the industry in Switzerland and it was it was just not there there was a few play there were a few players who were still uh, around and 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 brewing but there was nothing spectacular the the connection with the customer was pretty low to be honest uh, the pro quality of the products was not outstanding uh, we would not find the flavors and 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 the the kind of brand that we were you know look up to abroad so so then it became apparent that, okay, something could be done. And then I got further confirmation looking at what was happening in Scandinavian markets in the UK. And and so I was like, okay, well, it's happening also in Europe. It's not only a US thing. There's absolutely no reason in the world why this would not happen in Switzerland. And that's that's what really triggered the, okay, this was just an idea and now we have to make it a business. Basic question, what is the difference between a traditional beer and a craft beer? It's not volume related. A lot of people think it's volume related. Uh, I think it's spirit related. A For me, an industrial guy is someone who is basically making a commodity. You can swap around industrial laggers and basically see no difference to them. They spend millions in marketing, but it doesn't necessarily mean a difference. Sometimes they don't even have their own brewery. They contract brew all over. It's not about the story. It's not about what you offer behind. And and you have small guys who actually have kind of an industrial mindset who will produce something that's not so interesting. They don't put much soul into it and much interest into it. On the other hand, a craft brewer is someone who focuses first and foremost on the quality of what they deliver. And that, for me, value a lot. The It's a bit like an industry with a heart and a smile, I like to say. So uh, you've got to be passionate about what you do. You've got to be very interested about the people. It's a it's people business. We do something that's you know, basically, it's as old as the world and has been gathering people around beer forever. And and so if you share that passion and that interest and you're passionate about your product and you want to get the best thing out, then I think that it's, it's not really a volume question. It's about your interest and how you're aligned. We take decisions that are sometimes not efficient on an industrial basis, but we won't compromise on them because we just think it's the right thing to do. And a big guy would not do that. And the rise in craft, you know, as a general term, you know, which encompasses beer, but chocolate and all sorts of different um, items, right? This this is really riding, I guess, two waves, right? One is the, the sort of growth in disposable income. And the other one is the sort of death of mass marketing. Would you say that's fair to say? Which is, you know, because you can't mass market and get, it's harder to get people to buy an undifferentiated product at scale. 
on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, as people get wealthier, they're sort of demanding better quality products and they're more interested in in where these products come from and how, where they're, how they're sourced and if they're sustainable and so on. Do you think they're the two trends that you're riding with this with crop beer? Yeah, totally over the last maybe 50, 60 years, you know, there's been such a rise in, in consumer choices, you know, and people got a bit obsessed with choice. And then also quality, uh, price was a big trigger because all of a sudden became accessible to a majority to have access to a wide range of goods, which you'd go back in the early 20th century was not at all like that. And then you end up at, at the end of the 20th century, it was already a very different game with, you know, goods coming from all over the world and, and, and products that were once never available, available to masses. And I think that's the first part of the equation. Now, the second part of the equation is that people got used to diversity. They start to also look a bit deeper than just, okay, what do I have available? Is They start to look for the, the story behind they start to associate with the brands they want to support, maybe more values that they like. And I think that's the the rise of internet in the way that it increased the, the speed of information. And then people got just more, much more information about things. So it's, it's much harder to fool consumers today than what it was 30 years ago. So, so you can't just go around and say something that's completely wrong or that's completely not in line with your values and expect, you know, take people for fools and think they will just take it. So I think that this is a big change. Of course, there's, the, there's more wealth involved, but also there's just that people are more sensitive to what they consume. They think more. And, and I think if you're just doing a good job and you're being honest about it and you show it and you're caring and professional, then eventually you find a market as well. As long as you do something that's quality driven and that you, you actually mean it, then there's a market out there for you. How big can that market be? You know, is there a tension between, you know, this constant sort of fragmentation, this constant search for better quality? And then on the other hand, you know, producing a really good product at scale because, you know, some of these sort of quote unquote craft brewers like, you know, like Brewdog, for example, I mean, these, these, these guys have got really, really quite big and they're, they're distributing internationally. So is, does there, does there come a point at which you grow so big that you almost look like a mass market brand? I think it's a fair question. It, it's a big question of, uh, is it better to be a, a big fish uh, in a small pond or a small fish in a, in a small, or a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? And I think Brewdog, for example, is, has had like a very aggressive growth. They're fueling a lot of that. So for those who don't know, so they're a Scottish-based brewery. They brought a lot to the equation in terms of craft beer throughout Europe. Uh, they've been very disruptive and they've been expanding internationally. This is a bit against the kind of base idea of craft, which is, has some sort of local grounding to it. So we're not talking about historical beers and say you want, you know, special beer from a Belgian uh, abbey and, and, and that's, you won't find it anywhere else in the world and that's shipping all over the world. You know, craft beer is, it's an industrial process and someone in Iceland can do an excellent beer and someone in, in, in Vietnam can do an excellent beer given that they have access to the raw materials that they, of course, have to source internationally, but they can produce and brew something really qualitative. So I would say that the craft beer market tends to be a bit more local than the international beer market. And hence, some guys like Brewdog have tried to associate a lot with local brewers when they go abroad, not to get too much of this image of an international global brand. Whether this is successful or not is hard for me to say. But what's for sure is that I think that our market, for example, is still very Swiss at the moment, could evolve with time. But it's, it's, I think it's hard to be a really global brand and have a really close relationship with the consumer. Or you can have a close relationship, but it's hard to have in a product that's physical. I think there's some limitation to that one way or another. But isn't it about finding the right demographic for La Nebulis? You know, so, you know, there's a certain type of drinker and you identify with that drinker. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's about their lifestyle. Maybe it's about their age. And then you'll find that same demographic in all the places where you have, you know, quote unquote hipsters, right? So, so you, you know what I mean? Like you, you, you have an audience in Lausanne, you have an audience in Geneva, you have an audience in, in Zurich, and then maybe the next audience, natural audience is in Lyon or it's yeah. in Milan. I mean, it, it could be, of course. I think beer is an affordable luxury. Craft beer is an affordable luxury. It is a, it is a luxury because it comes at a premium and it comes at quite a premium if you look in percentage terms. But if you look in absolute terms, it's actually quite cheap and affordable for most people. So we do not see ourselves as a very exclusive good. We just target people who are conscious about what they want to drink, who like the taste, who likes the feel, who likes the 
branding and and who feel like they can have some tie with us one way or another so naturally we tend to go a bit local but of course you know this can resonate with people abroad this can resonate in a lot of different places but i think then in these places it will tend to be smaller size market than in our home markets it doesn't mean that there's no market it just means that it will be a bit more niche but again you know a niche market in shanghai might be as big as our local market here but demographics are obviously very important it, because it is such a widespread good, because it is consumed by so many people, of, you know, in terms of demographics, it might touch a lot of people anyways. But of course, we have like a core range of consumers who are much more likely to take the product than others, that's for sure. That just seems that's the mistake of mass market brands, right? Which is in order to appeal to every single demographic everywhere, they stand for nothing. Yeah. Whereas I think you can authentically stand for something. Yeah. And it, and that would almost, it would almost be better to target a small demographic across Europe than to sort of try to get too deep in Switzerland. Uh, well, I, I, I think that you can't touch, you can't touch everything. Um, and you can't touch everyone. That's for sure. I think that we can also stand for something that can be seen as local pride, you know, because we, we think it's how we want to be perceived eventually. And it's how we want to work towards. So we want to, you know, do things differently. And we want to brew the best beers we can with an independent uh, spirit and all of that. And I think you can reach the point where you are seen not just as an outstanding product, but also like as a as a symbol that can be, you know, seen and put forward. So in Lausanne already, in a lot of places, we're seen as really the beer of the place. And there's a sense of pride from people living there just because they they have a cool brand that's the cool beer that's being brewed uh, very close by and and it's part of it and and of course if they can see that brand elsewhere in Europe they would also advocate it so it's really I think it's a two thing and at the same time we also appeal to people who are very in line with the brand so so as I said you know our real core target group of people who will really fit with us they will also you know be all over Europe, maybe, and they will really associate with our products, our design, our spirit, all of that. And, and regardless of where they are, they might be a perfect match. And if they can have our, their hands on our product, they will do that. Tell, tell us, what's so special about Lanabellas, in your opinion? Well, I think is that we've seen the, I think we we've seen the whole thing as not only brewing the best beer, but as being part of something. So we haven't followed the typical oh let's try to make the best beer or let's try it. we we you know we thought about how are we going to you know activate with our customer do events things like this how are we going to you know do the best packaging we can how can we be very very active to support the local community how can we interact with other industries as well so we tried to be part of an ecosystem instead of just being a player somewhere and i think it makes quite a big difference between a lot of the players around you know it's 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 us three founders being very, very involved and the team that grew around is very, very involved and, and, and where it all takes place is Romandie in general and I would say mostly focus on, on La Clément in general. And, and, and there's a story behind it and there's the relationship we got with the people and we, we go down to meet customers, but not on the purpose of meeting customers, just because we go have drinks in the same places that our consumers go have drinks and we just see people there. We know, you know, everyone from bartenders to waiters to bar owners restaurant owners shop owners and, and so there's a very special relationship in that perspective which is very different from a lot of different brands what is the best selling beer that you have ah, now there's a bit of a competition but we have three brands that are really doing great and that's uh, sterling embuscade and zep uh that zep obviously has taken big hits because it's a very big beer for bars and restaurants and over the last two months plus it's been closed pretty much so it took a hit but uh sterling is getting stronger as well Ambuscade is, is still growing so i would say these three are really the three brands that are they're all the way at the top you have an ipa you have a pilsner you have a session ipa it's session ipa you have you know so you have all these different types of beers and is the is the idea that to appeal to everybody's different taste or is the idea that you can not just take market share from traditional beers but you can start to take market share from spirits and and wine and like what's the idea behind having such a broad range of beers 
Well, first of all, is it's it would be very boring to have only like one or two beers, and that's not in the spirit sure. of what we of what we do. I think it's very hard to have a favorite among your children. You should not. So uh, the thing is, we are it's it's part of our culture to have a ranch and to have diversity, and of course, we try not to overlap too much styles uh, together. Uh, we have like a lager that's totally that can compete against bigger um, bigger industrial breweries. But most of the time, it's still priced at a premium. And so it's not necessarily really scavenging on the big guys market. And we're not necessarily trying to scavenge on craft beer themselves. It's just that the craft beer segment is growing. So by growing, we have more space for our products. We try to have a portfolio of products that's balanced, that we like. And uh, we've built it with that in mind. Of course, you know, we wanted a pale ale, we wanted an IPA, we added a session because we it's something that was really missing in our range. We wanted something that was highly drinkable with lower alcohol. The only motto that we have uh, internally is that we do not produce something that we don't like ourselves. So any single product that goes out here is something that we would happily consume ourselves. And if not, it's not making it. And I think you have sort of very passionate customers like me, right? Real, real brand advocates. What's the plan to get those, your passionate customers and use that passion and channel it to make the product better? And I guess more importantly, use that passion to help you to sell more. Well, I don't. I, I think the best thing is to embark them on the journey one way or another. I think we are a great brewery. We're going to pull back, you know, visits uh, on the schedule, ideally from July going forward. We want to get as many people to come and visit as possible. And you rarely say, speak about the beer that you had yesterday, except if it was something truly outstanding, but you, you, you're not going to pick up a discussion with that. But you might pick up a discussion on the visit that you've done and how great he was and how you discovered this and that about the process and all of this. And then you might get these other people to come and visit. You came, you tasted beer, you liked the place, you liked the atmosphere, you liked all that. The likeliness of you consuming more of that product next time you hit the bar or Telling to the bar manager, hey, why don't you have this product in stock? Uh, or picking up that product next time you go uh, to the supermarket just shoots through the roof once you've seen that. And we've seen this with, with some of the bar managers, bartenders, after they came and, and, and understood how, you know, like, because our place really sweat of passion. And so once you really got into this and you saw it and you you actually kind of trigger something, you get more interested about the product, about the whole story behind. And it's much cooler to speak about something that you've seen, you know, the, the, the kind of like the back scene of it than, than to talk about something that you don't really know about. I think big brands have nothing to say. They have to spend millions to find a storyline that they can share to their consumers and we have a lot to say we just need to get the people in to see it and after i think they will do the job themselves and they will advocate for what they like or they didn't like and if they don't like we're well we're actually small enough so that we take very seriously any comments that we have and we can actually act upon it quite fast compared to or much faster than a big guys so that's that's also a big difference differentiating point for us tell us about sema tourne Yes, sure. So, um, you know, of course, uh, there was a multitude of uh, campaigns that were launched uh, by a lot of different actors throughout the, the pandemic on how to support your consumers, how to support clients, how to support the society as a whole as well. We thought about a lot of different things. We thought about, of course, it was this huge talk about should we do like, uh, should we do some disinfectant, uh, hand disinfectant, but we realized, okay, we cannot, we can't produce pharma grades uh, pharma grade uh, disinfectant. It's not going to work. We're a brewery. We're not distilling and we can't even bottle the product. So that was a no-go. Uh, but we really wanted to help with something, you know, because the whole company is not going to a dead stop. But it was very, very slow because more than 50% of our sales is with bar and restaurants. So all of a sudden, you have zero sales with that. And, um, and we thought, well, we have to help these guys out as well because if they go down, we also go down. You know, it's terrible. We need to find something to do. And um, we didn't want to do something complicated because we know the guys and we they're not very big into paperwork. They're not very. So we wanted to do something that's quite easy, that requires minimal effort from their side and that can bid 
bring what they need most, that is cash, just to survive. And we thought, well, we have a bit of capacity because, of course, it's being unused. And we know how to make great beer because it's it's our day-to-day job. And we don't have an e-shop because we didn't then. Uh, so we thought, well, what could we do that would be significant? Well, that would be saying, well, we're going to deliver our self beer to a limited area because we can deliver throughout Switzerland. And people can buy a pack of 24 and give back and select which bar or restaurant they want to support. And the bar or restaurant needs to be in Lausanne or in Geneva, the two areas that we deliver. And if they don't want to pick, they just say, okay, I split pots and we give we give to all the different things. And we decided, well, we'll give half the sales. So that's a very, it's, it's not a very profitable operation at all for us. But okay, we get the beer moving. And most importantly, we support bars and restaurants. So for every franc that we get, we give back 50 cents. So it's, it's, it's that simple. And the people could select which bar and restaurant they can, they want to support. So of course, people were stuck at home. They can't do much. So, you know, they might as well get a beer in the evening and they might as well help the bar that they used to go to, to have drinks because that bar will be in dire need at this, uh, at this point in time. And uh, c'est ma tournée means it's my round. And um, what we thought is that very often when you go to a bar or restaurant, you know, the, the bar owner will give you a round at uh, the end of an evening just to thank you for being there. And I thought, well, now it's time for, for you consumers to give a round to your bar or to your restaurant to help them out. And you can do that by contributing no more than paying the normal price for your beers. And we will go the extra mile and give 50% of that to the bar or restaurant of your choice. And the only easy, so we made some posters that bars and restaurants could put on their, on their, uh, how do you call that, on their glass, on, on their windows and some, some banners they could put on their social media. So it was a very simple operation. At the end of the day, it was uh, put in May and it's been running since then. The last question is, will you keep direct distribution to consumers post-pandemic? It was something we didn't consider before, but we had surprisingly high traction on that. Or I don't know if it's surprising, actually, but we had excellent traction on that. Now the website is actually put up. So it is very possible that we keep this as a branch of business for us. Also, because some products that we sell are sometimes a bit more difficult to go to get out on standard channels, because you might have distributors who don't want to stock up small volumes. If you do some funky beers, then it's always hard. You can find a lot of people who will be interested. We actually often have consumers who call us up at the brewery and say, well, I've seen that you're releasing this beer and I can't find it anywhere. How do I get it there? And, and sometimes there's only a few places that will actually pick it up, even though there's demand because they don't want, they can't be bothered to, you know, buy just a few boxes. They can't be bothered to change their menu. They can't be bothered to make some space in the shelves, but still there's demand for it. So I think for that simple reason as well, it's a very good channel that we've never really used. So, so most likely we'll keep it up and running. Yeah. And can you ship internationally? Complicated as of today. We ship internationally uh, on occasion for by professionals. So if we have like some bars in France or in Belgium or in Scandinavia or in England who want to buy the beer, sometimes some have just contacted distributors and it's going through like that. Uh, so it's been, I would say, a non-systematic business, but it's been happening ever since 2015. We've been selling beer internationally, but not to private consumers because it's very difficult. And you need to go through a guy. You need to go through a middleman. It's, it's, I don't see how you do it without. So. Perfect. Arthur, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for listening to Structural Shifts by Aperture. To learn more about our Aperture community, visit aperturehub.co. We are strategy for the networked age. Until next time.